And that's the prediction is that electric vehicle batteries will be everything about the lithium ion industry. They will be completely focused on, you know, the performance metrics that make sense for that industry. Things like cell phones in terms of cell phone batteries are kind of going to be meaningless, um, you know, in, in terms of market numbers and dollars. And that's what's coming. Through the Noise with your host, Ernesto Glucksman. Uh, Dr. Wang, thank you for joining me on the show. I am super excited to get the opportunity to talk to you because I've been wanting to understand more and more about uh, battery technology, the current state of affairs in this world that you're in. Um, and you sound like you're the guy to talk to about this. Um, before I get into some questions, let me just let me just uh, give a little bit of a breakdown. You are the CEO of Nanograph. And um, Nanograph's an advanced materials company uh, in the energy storage space. Your background, Dr. Wang, is fascinating. You've worked with like the smallest consumer batteries and medical devices to like the biggest stuff for cars and grids. Um, so you seem to you can you've seen the the battery energy storage market from top to bottom. Um, and you've worked for big, big groups here, uh, Duracell, Procter & Gamble, um, Gillette, among a bunch of others. And you have a PhD in chemistry, I presume somewhat related to energy, probably. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> that's what it comes down to is the chemistry inside these things. So thank you. Thank you for taking a bit of your time and you're super busy. I think you're in the middle of all kinds of negotiations. So um, let's just jump right into it. Um, can I like to usually ask the guest to give us a little bit of like the dinner table conversation. Like when someone asks you like, you know, Dr. Wang, what do you do for a living? Um, what do you, what do you give them? What do you start with? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, Ernesto, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, over dinner, um, you know, typically I'll tell them that I, my background is in chemistry and, um, I'm part of a company called Nanograph. Um, we're a startup company. We make, um, a very special material. It's an anode material. It's silicon based. And, you know, at a very layman's level, it makes batteries significantly better. And that uh, plays a role, you know, not only in, you know, things like consumer electronics, but down the line, it's going to matter for electric vehicles um, and even someday the grid. So my layman's understanding about battery technology, I just hear, you know, you just hear lithium. You think, you know, that's the stuff that's going into these cars. Um, I certainly, you know, that this is the stuff that's extending the ranges of battery technology. I just think of batteries. I think it's just, it's a heavy thing, just sticking under the carriage of a car. It weighs a lot. Somehow pe people have figured out how to charge it fast or faster than the typical type of stuff. Um, where are we at? So, you know, where are we at with that technology? Yeah, yeah, good, good comments. And and I totally recognize that sometimes from the outside world, they, they think that batteries are relatively simple. We just plug them in and we jam them into our devices and they work and make our lives better. But batteries are incredibly complex. There's a lot of chemistry, thermodynamics and kinetics that go into these things to make them work just right. Um, the bigger, biggest driver of battery performance, especially recently, I'd say over the last 15 years or so, it's been the chemistry. So it's all about the chemistry and the future. And when I say future, I'm probably talking about the next decade or two. Um, I, I think you can expect that to continue to be true. Um, and where we are today, like if you look at the history of lithium ion, right, which goes back to 1992 until now, um, there was kind of this very steep increase, um, you know, year on year improvement in energy density, right, which allows devices to run longer and make them smaller and devices get smaller, etc. You know, over the last decade, that's really plateaued. And we've been searching for new chemistries. Um, in fact, if you look at the last decade, arguably, it's only been about eight to 9% improvement over the last decade. So, you know, on average, less than a percent wow. a year. And that's, you know, what you commonly hear when I talk to people at the dinner table, and they, they ask me, so, so when are batteries going to get better? And that's where Nanograph comes into play. Um, you know, we've been at this a while. Um, I think most in this industry, people that are sophisticated um, in the battery industry understand that 
um, you know, the next thing that'll probably drive performance is going to be some form of silicon anode. And then I think beyond that, you're probably looking at um, different types, you know, a very different type of chemistry. And I'll put in that category things like solid state batteries or lithium metal batteries. These things are the future of what's going to happen down the road. So um, that's where we are today. And uh, so this, can you give us a sense of what kind of the difference somewhere I saw on, on when I was looking into this with the, uh, on your website or something, you, the lithium batteries have like this sort of milliwatt, they have like a measure, a unit of measure. I mean, you got to go basic on me, especially for my show, but you have a milliwatt amp hour per gram categorization right and i saw and i don't really know what that means the unit like i can't visualize it but it said something like 372 for the standard stuff the lithium what we have now what goes into tesla cars and other things with the silicon based anodes which is part of the material that go into this battery stuff you're reaching 550 you know, almost twice as much, maybe, um, depending on what it is. Can you, can you go into some of the, why that's, what's the difference? What's the, what is the chemical differences there? Why that, why such a difference? Yeah. Yeah. Great. And, and let me make some minor corrections to what you just yeah. said. I, I, I mean, even though those numbers are wonderful and the units are wonderful, I, I make it calls on the phone at 500 and, you know, so Anyways, the unit, the typical units of energy okay. density are watt hours per kg, which is okay. um, energy per weight or watt hours per liter, which is energy per volume. And okay. one of the things, and you know, many of your listeners may have seen this in the news, we recently demonstrated literally the world's most energy density, energy dense battery. So we've reached 800 watt hours per liter, which is um, the way we like to put it um, is a decade's worth of improvement over what's out there today, which really is a lot when you think about, um, you know, the plateau that's there. And if you draw the curve, it's pretty significant. And um, there's no question that this is a value add in terms of, you know, consumer perceivable differences. And so um, what's special here is that we've been able to prove that our technology is a drop in to existing lithium ion manufacturing um, infrastructure from a cost perspective. And of course, the performance spec perspective, um, it's a compelling value proposition. Um, and, you know, I think we're one of the, we, we have a different take on things and a lot of other um, startup companies and the bigger guys out there. But um, what's undeniable is that we've been able to prove things out in a standard form factor and, um, you know, believe it or not, you know, the performance speaks for itself. It, but, but what what are you wrestling with in terms of like the characteristics? Like why did the industry go down the path of the sort of the lithium ion stand? Why are we mostly there? But the silicon anode base is sort of like what's around the corner on some other article I read in the year 2020. This is probably where it's going to break out, where the lithium anodes are going to come into play. Like what are the factors around that? That'd be interesting yeah, to understand. yeah there, there, there's a lot of them. And you know, it, as you said earlier in the podcast, it's it's exciting times, right? Every other news story, um, whether that the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, or otherwise, is about batteries, how important they are, how they're getting better. There's a lot of claims about um, what's gonna happen and the changes that are, you know, industry is going to be disrupted, et cetera, et cetera. I tend to be on the very conservative side, like you said. I, I this is not video, and I've been around the been around the block and I've seen a lot of things come and go. I think what's important when you look at technologies is, um, you know, the, the battery industry tends to be what I'll say evolutionary as opposed to disruptions don't happen every day, right? They happen maybe every 30 or 40 years where we have um, a fundamentally different chemistry. Lithium mine has been around since 1992. Um, it continues to be the first choice when it comes to mobile power, electric vehicles, and probably someday the grid as well. Um, that's where we are. I think there's a lot of FOMO out there. There's a lot of wild claims, in my opinion, that say, hey, we're going to have this fundamentally different battery chemistry. Um, that's going to be here in 2025. It's going to replace lithium ion. And oh, by the way, the, the industry, which is you know multi, multi-billion dollar industry is completely going to change. And all these big players are going to go away. I think those are tall claims. Um, and investors and others can believe what they want. I, I do think um, 
lithium mine, there's still room to move, even though the last decade might um, not be a great example of that. I think our latest achievements suggest that um, you know, our type of chemistry, silicon anodes, are clearly the next technology that's going to move lithium ion forward. And, you know, it's not just me saying that. There's other people, for example, if you go to Tesla's battery day, they they have this wonderful graph that shows that 54% of the range, um, future range improvements of electric vehicles are going to come from batteries um, in one dimension or another. And of that 54%, the largest contributor is the anode or the silicon anode as part of that. So, you know, Tesla being a leader in this category certainly believes everything that, that I've said here. Are they using silicon anode based stuff or they've started to work on that? Absolutely. Yeah. So the, at least what's, you know, I haven't taken a part of Model S to, to check, but the claims are that they have what is called the Model S Plaid series or version. I think it was part of this, and a few years ago, people were calling it the ludicrous mode, or Elon was calling it the ludicrous mode. This battery, this, sorry, this that Model S Plaid apparently does have batteries that contain about 5 to 7% silicon. This is what I hear. Did um, maybe we should just break up a little bit, just uh, or backtrack a little bit. Can you give us sort of just a rough breakdown of the process with lithium? Because I, I, it seems like there's an incumbent battery manufacturing process, this lithium stuff. What's kept the silicon-based anode, if you can get like 20%, let's say conservatively more energy density per whatever, what's what's held it back from adoption why why are we in 221 reading an article saying 220 would have been the breakout why are we still in that zone why are we in a startup yeah. mode i guess versus yeah, yeah much further along no it's a great question so silicon's nothing new right silicon oxide silicon anodes are nothing new we've known about them for over 20 years right um why aren't they in well they are now in commercial batteries but why isn't this broken out um, earlier. So it goes back to the traditional challenge or, or, or historical challenges. And with silicon, there's kind of two things. Um, one is um, the SEI stability. So that that is the solid electrolyte interface issue. So all battery materials form an SEI at the surface. And um, I guess a layman's way of understanding this is there's kind of like a passivating layer that forms on both cathodes and anodes. This exists in all material, but they need to be stable. And one of the um, interesting things about silicon, and it's part of the challenge, is that when it's charged, the battery particle actually ex it expands quite a bit. It expands almost um, 300%. And when it does that, um, invariably, it begins to crack, and there's all these other issues, and accelerates the SEI issues. It also accelerates the other fundamental mechanism, which is called electrical disconnection. So what happens is um, these particles that expand crack in a gazillion pieces and become electrically disconnected and then don't participate in the energy storage of the battery. So it's really the SEI instability and the electrical disconnection. And so our company, with respect to those two problems, I'd like to claim that we've just about solved both of them. You know, uh, we have a proprietary composition that results in a more stable SEI. That might not be grammatically correct, but I think it, you, you know what I mean, a more stable SEI. The other part is the electrical disconnection, and that has to do with the graphene. And the graphene has some wonderful properties that allows us to make sure that all the particles, even if they do crack, are still connected electrically and then can still participate um, in the battery chemistry. And so, you know, we've have, we have a unique solution to these traditional problems. And we're an exciting, at an exciting phase of the company where, um, like I said, we've been able to demonstrate the performance in a standard form factor. This form factor, this battery, um, which is called an 18650, um, we do have some customers at the um, end of the value stream that it does provide value to, 
and you know, in a nutshell, they're willing to buy it and buy a lot of them. So where we are as a company is we're beginning to mm. expand and you know, transition from a startup company into a product company and production company. And that's that's really exciting. And we're what's more exciting is we're doing that in the United States, which I think is is kind of the the momentum where everything is headed. Well, I'm sure that's m- music to uh, potential larger institutional investors, right? They like to, they like to see startups that already have customers, and that which is what they need your what you need their capital for is to expand the operations, right? You Absolutely. don't need it to, to find the buyers necessarily, right? Um, but that sounds exciting. Is this a scenario where, like, I mean, for something to expand three hundred percent, literally the battery would be like flux, like as you charged it, it would kind of blow up and then as that expansion and contraction happens it breaks the pieces inside that then they don't participate in the electrical thoroughput or whatever you whatever you guys call it the engineer yeah yeah no it's a good question so you know what battery designers do when they make their batteries they need to make sure that there's enough room to accommodate that expansion but mm-hmm. silicon's ability to store lithium or hold extra electrons is immense so you know, pure silicon in theory is, uh, I forget the exact number, it's something like 3,000 milliamp hours per gram, where conventional graphite, which is the incumbent technology, is about 360 milliamp hours per gram. So there's a huge difference there. And so that's why people, even if they leave space in the battery for the silicon to expand, you still come out ahead. Hmm. Right. But, and then, and then part of that process then is all, so you're sort of, t- but you're tackling the problem at the two ends of this issue, sort of the expansion part, if you can get it to stabilize more then it expands less. Right. Um, but then the other part is if it, as it does expand, making sure that the cracking or whatever still continues to be the right material. So you, you, so, you have a proprietary process around all that, that you, that you guys have figured out for yourselves. Absolutely. And I think the other two things to, to note about the value proposition are that, um, and, and we really from, from the get go have always thought this way of, you know, design for manufacturability and cost. Cause that's at the end of the day, um, you know, you'll see and hear about some very, what I'll call exotic solutions. And they're really neat and very innovative, but can you produce it at cost at scale? And can it be, you know, for a reasonable cost, can you provide it to an electric vehicle manufacturer, for example? And many many of the examples that you hear out there use um, methods, for example, of like vapor deposition, which is incredibly expensive. And, you know, it's very hard to imagine that you can produce a material um, that on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis is competitive with the incumbent technologies because that's what you're going to be um, compared against, right? And the industry literally, especially the big boys, the the tier one battery producers are not going to adopt a technology that isn't cost effective. Um, There are very few people, if you say I increase the battery density uh, by 10%, but I triple the cost, it's that not going to work out. That doesn't yeah. do the job, right? Exactly. It's, and 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 just so we understand, vapor deposition. That's like a, you're spraying this, coating it co- as part of that process. There's like a coating electrical process in creating so, battery materials, right? So so to be clear, we don't do that. You don't do that. Yeah, Nanograph doesn't do that. You have a wet chemistry. We have a wet chemistry, <laughs> and it's completely scalable. We've already scaled it to ten tons per year. Um, you know all of the numbers that we look at is cost effective, right? We know that the biggest drivers in cost are the materials. And um, we know if we scale to, let's say a thousand tons per year, that on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis, we're actually slightly cheaper than graphite. Okay. Now, now you, now you get the uh, accountant's attention, right? Because if we can get you, get the machinery to, to, to this scale and you have buyers that are willing to buy at that amount, now you're, now you're, cheaper than the stuff that they would get and the energy density is how much more into it how much more would you get would yeah so add? at least you know what we've been able to demonstrate very solidly i can say we're 28 percent better than incumbent graphite 18650 cells that's what we've been able to demonstrate so in other words your electric vehicle let's take a model s for example which by the way uses 18650s would drive 28 percent longer Okay. 186. Sorry. That was a, 
It's 18650s, actually. Do I have one on my desk? I did. Sorry, don't have it right now, but we did. Um, it is the most and it is the oldest lithium ion um, form factor. You know, you and I are old enough to remember these really honking thick laptop computers. Um, mm -hmm. That's where it started. They, they put those in. It's bigger than a double A. Um, but would fit into our laptop computers. And um, it's what actually is using the Model S and I believe the Model X as well today. Wow. Okay. So um, look, can we talk a little bit about, I mean, that sounds very compelling and I wish you the best of luck getting the right, you should have institutional investors knocking on your door trying to get their cash in. But I, I can we can we go into like the scaling challenge? Because I, I think before when we were you know preparing for the episode you showed showed me an interesting graph where we really the the electric car industry's got a unique challenge like right now i mean if you were just i think tesla has like a million cars and i don't know how many other evs are out on the marketplace but it's basically like what 2 3% of the car fleet in the united states right yeah and it, it, to, so the where we are today, and this this number always shocks the heck out of me. I okay. up until a few years ago was not aware of like how dramatic it was, but today we're about of all the vehicles out on the road today, about two to three percent of them are electric vehicles, and that two to three percent that's electric currently makes up over seventy percent of the lithium ion battery industry. That's that kind of just wow. shows how important electric vehicles are to the lithium ion battery industry, and also gives you a sense of how big and potentially rapidly this industry might grow. 70%. That means all other batteries, all your batteries you use for your toys, for your laptops, for your cell phones, that all gets squished into this 30% category when most of the lithium batteries that are being generated are for these cars that are only two or 3% of the car fleet today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think wow. that shocks the heck out of people, but you know, what I usually say is imagine when we go from two or three percent to like five percent, right? And what that in a short period of time, and that's the prediction is that, you know, electric vehicle batteries will be everything about the lithium ion industry. They will be completely focused on, you know, the performance metrics that make sense for that industry. Things like cell phones in terms of cell phone batteries are kind of going to be meaningless. Um, you know, in, in terms of market numbers and dollars. And that's what's coming. And that's kind of part of the problem. Um, but electric vehicle batteries are everything in terms of yeah. the mine industry. So let's say you had a, just happened to have a, a, a battery manufacturing factory somewhere and you're looking at the marketplace. What types of batteries would we want to sell, make to sell? You're going to look at this and you're going to go, well, there's going to be a big push for all these cars. So we're going to, we're going to make those. We're going to try to sell it into the biggest marketplace, right? That's kind of the, the thinking, the, 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 the thing you would wonder Absol about. Absolutely. Right? So when you talk to the tier one people, all they want to talk about is electric vehicles. So let's the LGs, the Samsungs, the Panasonics, the ATLs, the big guys. It's all they want to talk about. That's all they're focused on um, in, in terms of capturing those markets. And you know, that, that's a problem for a lot of device makers that are not electric vehicle. Um, that is a problem for a host of people, including, for example, our U.S. military. And that's, um, you know, some of the information that we had talked about earlier was, you know, what this translates into. Not even it's it's a national security concern, you know, in terms of the military and how important batteries are to um, the future soldier, even the soldier today, honestly. And what a problem this will be, I think, in time for even people like Apple. Yeah, I, I had read that Apple uh, or I, I, was it Apple? I wasn't too sure. Um, they're all trying to secure their own battery production work. They're trying to partner up more, right? They're trying to basically secure the supply of battery materials for their products and services. Because if you suddenly have every, they can't find any more manufacturers because they're all making car batteries, um, that's going to put a huge strain on their ability to actually make new devices, right? Hundred percent. So that's pretty. That's pretty terrifying. I think I heard Elon Musk in an interview once mentioned that like we really need to ramp up battery production. Like 
really ramp it up. And this just puts it into, into stark contrast here, just how far, because this isn't including grids. This isn't including maybe batteries used for homes or for buildings or for really important redundancy systems, hospitals, whatever. This is just the car. <laughs> this is just the car industry. Yeah. And, you know, the un- other interesting fact that I think people also don't get or don't know um, is that there aren't a ton of people jumping into the ring, right? You just mentioned that this is this is a need, right? We all need call it bespoke batteries or Apple, you know, for the next iPhone or iPhone 20 or whatever it is, they want the battery maker to revolve around the device. And it kind of looks like the device has to revolve around the battery these days. And so that's a problem. But one of the major questions and things I've been, you know, we think about at our company is why aren't more people jumping into the ring if this is such a big need? Why aren't they doing that? And you know, the, the reason, and many people in the industry understand this, is the, the, the business of producing batteries is an incredibly difficult business. Um, it's, it's kind of three things, right? It um, requires large amounts of capital to build a battery factory, right? That, that's one of the issues. The other issue, it's, at least historically, is you know, margins are really tight. And you know we're talking about much less than ten percent margins on making a battery, and the the third one is there's a great deal of risk involved in terms of um, you know batteries are complex. They need to be manufactured with very tight tolerances sometimes. If they're not manufactured right, and we've seen this before, and mm. you know in the history of batteries is that you know they can go into thermal runaway and there could be a big problem. People can't get hurt. Cars can explode, et cetera. So. It's the liability, the capital costs, and the margins that mm-hmm. keep people yeah. from jumping in. Yet, at the same time, you know, when you think about the value chain, the battery production part of the value chain is probably like the most strategic and perhaps arguably the most important, right? They're the gatekeepers to new technology. So in terms of the upstream guys, um, people like myself developing new technologies, I'm at the mercy of the people that make the batteries. And if you think about downstream for that, batteries make up, let's take an electric vehicle, for example, batteries make up somewhere between 35 to 45% of the cost of an electric vehicle today. And like I said earlier, they make up 54% of the future range. So when you think about cost and performance, the thing that kind of determines how good an electric vehicle you have, is the battery. So it's an important thing, it's strategic, but there aren't too many people jumping in the ring to do it because it's a tough business. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so there's like a bottleneck in the middle of it for like new battery technology solutions, like with the, the stuff you guys have and the need for, you know, bespoke shaping of battery systems on the other end of this. And in the middle, there's a glut of, not a glut, there's a, there's a bottleneck of not enough manufacturing or not enough uh, people because of the risk associated on either end of this stuff, man, I, how do you, how do you, what, well, I mean, Dr. Wang, you, you've been in the battery business for, for a long time. I mean, have you looked at other industries when new technology had these sort of gaps, this sort of bottlenecks, how they may, is there anything out there that you can model that the industry should try, is attempting to model itself at? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think there's other industry examples for sure. Um, I mean, and it's not to say that, you know, we certainly couldn't look at our own industry. And so one of the statistics, um, you know, that that people like to throw around and and it's kind of, you know, that oftentimes the villain these days is China, right? What have they done? So uh, I think I had heard a factoid recently that 76% of the battery production capability in the world resides in China. So how has this happened in China and it being such a difficult business? How have they done it? Well, um, if you look, and this is not to say this is the only way you could do it, but they've had um, probably close to two decades worth of government support to get this infrastructure off the ground. I think the Chinese government, um, love them or hate them, understood that this was important for the future. You know, all it takes is one trip to China and, you know, you see the smog and the pollution issues and you go, okay. You know, in terms of the grid, in terms of electric vehicles, batteries are one of the most important things. And so 
they've consistently, you know, call it almost two decades now, of just put in money and supported companies to make sure that a tough business was viable and existed. And today, you know, honestly, I, I think they, um, I mean, I think the facts speak for itself, the fact that they have 70% of the production capacity and it's so important for the future. Um, not to say that, again, not to say that this is the only way you do it, but certainly the government can play a role. And I, and I think when I look at, you know, the national security concerns we have in our country, in the United States, um, I, I certainly think the government can play a huge role in getting this off the ground. And it appears that this administration is keen on doing that. Um, the policies are beginning to come down and the details of how they want to do it is beginning to come into, uh, into clear, it's becoming, becoming more clear, but um, it's a tough problem. And I don't, I don't think there's any, um, any question that we're sort of behind the game here. Mm. Um, but it's not to say that we can catch up. And I think we will. And, you know, just the final word on this, one of the reasons I think we will is that, you know, our country and history shows us that like one of our, one of the greatest things that we can do in this country is, is get our innovation out into the commercial marketplace. And we certainly can do that. Um, you know, we have the best universities in the world, arguably. And when you look at lithium ion, again, arguably the most important technologies, even lithium ion chemistry itself, which won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, was all invented by Americans. So how do we take those upstream advantages and get them downstream? That's a great question. I think the government's working on that. I think we're working in the right directions. And I can tell you or guarantee you that battery production is going to play a role in that and making sure that there is an American entrant because they're the gatekeepers to this. And to an extent, they control where that technology goes and how fast it enters the marketplace. So, you know, if I was to whisper in someone's ear in the government, I would say that don't forget about the batteries. Yes, it's a tough business, but don't forget about it because that's the most strategic part of the value chain. Hmm. Well, I mean, the other way to look at a tough business is that it's kind of a market barrier for other competition, right? So if you can crack that nut in that in that spot, whether it's the U.S. government helping stimulate uh, the innovations in the manufacturing process or not, it then it's an inve it's, it's investment, right? And and now that you're not talking about taking some esoteric, you know, lab created technology that doesn't have any customers. <laughs> there's customers. There's like a need, and that it's pretty clear that this is where we're headed, right? When you have what GM and Ford and everybody suddenly declaring that they're going to do batteries, battery EVs too. It's, it's, you know, the race is on. Um, yeah. Well, so, so Ernesto, this is, this is the issue I, to, to me. It's that, okay. So I've told you it's a tough business. I've told you there aren't a lot of U S people jumping in the ring or rushing to do this. Right. And there's good reasons for that, as I mentioned. So what is happening? I mean, you're seeing, um, for big foreign companies that can take the risk that have the stomach for it, understand that it's strategic and they're jumping into the ring and partnering with the General Motors Ford and Stellantis of the world, right? And I also mentioned that they're gatekeepers to American technology. So there's an issue here for sure. And I don't see any American companies doing it. Um, it's, there's a gap there and it's a problem. Um, you know, to the extent that, you know, the US government can encourage US companies to get into the ring and support it to buy American, et cetera. There's a lot of different policies that could um, get us back into the game, so to speak. But right now, um, I would argue that, you know, the future of our electrical, electric vehicle infrastructure and technologies for lithium mine are somewhat controlled by foreign entities. Um, that ought to be troubling for a lot of people. Right, that should if, um, if you're an America first type person, you would think you'd want us to be looking at how do we invest. On the other hand, the fact that you have this technology and it sounds like it's a drop in into existing processes, right? So if I had, if I was creating batteries overseas somewhere, your particular nanograph technology solution that can increase up to 30%, perhaps, uh, depending on how it's all put together, 
slips into the existing manufacturing processes. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a component, to, right? And could I say it's an additive in some way? Yeah, absolutely. I think additives a great term for it. That's what it. That's exactly what it is. And it's an additive that you sprinkle a little bit of this in there, and it makes batteries significantly better. So you know, at a very fundamental layman's level, that's 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 what we've got. And, and, you know, and then at the other end of this is just going to have to be maybe just, just doing the manufacturing where, well, there's overseas infrastructure investment for some of that, right? At least for the foreseeable future, especially given that the EV markets, I mean, they're, if you, I don't know, if you look up any of the Tesla projections, they want to be at, at 20 million, some cars, you know, and they have a million and I don't know how many the rest are, but doesn't seem like it's a big number right now. And that represents 2%. And that represents 70% of all battery manufacturing efforts, right? So, I mean, it's a it's a, gonna be a huge marketplace, I think, to grab on and to participate in, I suppose. Um, and it sounds like you're in the right spot, at least for a startup to come in. <laughs> and I, you know, Dr. Wang, I wish you best of luck. Um, uh, I appreciate getting, it. You know, getting into, getting some customers and then, new investments. What, what is it like? Um, what, what, what would be the next level up for you guys um, in the technology that you have? Like what's the, where would this investment go into? Um, so, so just sorry to clarify the question. You're, you're, where, where is our, if, if somebody came in with, you know, said, okay, great, let's do another, let's do another injection of capital funds. Where, where would it go? Um, is it to, you know, is it part of, it's the scaling up of the, of the development of the additives? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so part of the roadmap over the next year, um, to two years, the the plan is to, um, onshore our production. Now we have mentioned earlier, we have 10 tons per year production uh, capabilities in, um, in Asia, specifically in Japan. And we're going to be onshoring that here in the United States. Um, we kind of see this as kind of the, the green field, if you will. Um, we think uh, battery manufacturing, made in America, electric vehicles, all these things are going to be coming online in the United States over the next decade. And it's going to be exciting times. Um, we, we believe that the battery industry, which historically you know, really since the beginning of lithium ion has been focused and centralized in Asia. I think that's beginning to change. You're hearing about gigafactories really all over the world. In Europe, the United States has plans. We imagine that that will happen and we'd like to keep our, you know, technology in our own backyard, so to speak. That seems to be the momentum. I mean, um, there was a Wall Street Journal article recently that quoted um, the new the new DOE secretary, um, Granholm, as uh, I forget the exact quote, but it was something like, if we're going to pay for technologies, great technologies, then they should be manufactured here. Uh, we tend to agree with her. I think, um, you know, we, we've gotten a great deal of support from the U.S. government in a variety of different forms, whether that's Department of Defense, Department of Energy, um, the Vehicle Technology Office, et cetera. Um, we'd like to be the flagship of, you know, the technologies that actually differentiate American uh, vehicles, devices um, out in the world. And we, we think we're setting ourselves up for that. So that's where the cash is going. We need to expand at this point hmm. and make sure that our materials get into every single battery that's out there over the next decade. How, um, you know, kind of just curious, just looking back on your career, given that where you worked at, um, how, did, uh, how did a scrappy startup get your attention? How did they compel you to jump in on on a very stressful stage of building a business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, my personal story, you know, I'm first generation Chinese American. So so my my parents came to the United States back in the 50s and went to school here and, and got jobs. And I think, you know, there there were a lot of things going on at that time. Um, my 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 parents are, are very um what I'll say typically Asian. I'm probably getting in trouble for this, but they're very practical, you know, with, with me, it was always about, okay, go to college, get a job, make sure you can put food on the table. That's kind of what, you know, as, as immigrants in this country, we're very focused on doing. Right. And, you know, I, I played that game for many years in my career and worked for big companies, played it safe, so to speak. Um, I had always secretly dreamed about being an entrepreneur. 
Um, you know, I grew up hearing about stories about Steve Jobs and then more recently people like Elon Musk. It was something I always wanted to do. Um, it kind of got to a point in my career and I said, you know, it's now or never, you know, and um, about six years ago, I, uh, I left a, a very good paying job and corner office, et cetera, to, um, to do it here in Chicago um, to kind of push things forward and um, make my own luck, if you will. Well, I got to, um, I should, you know, I, I thank you, Dr. Wang. I think that that's the, that's the, the immigrant story that we want to hear. That's the reason your parents sacrificed to get here. Maybe they don't necessarily agree with all your choices, perhaps risky as it is, but you know, there's no better place in, I think in this world to start a business and take a chance. And frankly, given where we are with battery, the state of battery technologies, you might very well be the next guy that thank God you were there to actually push oh. it forward. So God willing, Dr. Wang, please, I have to keep talking to you. Come back on the show. I want to do this again. I want to see how you guys progress. I'm sure there's going to be news from you guys, given the uh, compelling um, product. Is product? It's product. Given yeah. the compelling thing that yeah. you have here. Five years ago, we'd say technology, and today I'll say product. It's product. Products. You got a customer base. It's just 